All right, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night, cold winter, winter Florida. Winter Florida. And so anybody who's watching at home, we have moved into the Bible study room. And so we are back in our safe space. The, the Bible study room, we feel we, we're, we're, we're in our place now. So uh, let's open up in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the privilege to gather together this evening. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, that you're in control and we love you and we give you praise for everything. And just thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives and in the church. Thank you for the excitement, Lord. We're over here in the Bible study room and, and it's nice to hear the kids again running around and we love it. It's just life. We love we love life, Father, and thank you for this Christmas season. And now, Father, as we uh, study tonight, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts, Father. Encourage us from your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So turn to 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel 2. So I thought it'd be a good study to study the kings of Israel, because studying the kings of Israel, is it's the history of Israel. And we'll see the good kings, the bad kings. We'll see the kingdoms uh, divided. There's a lot in there that I think once you get see the kings, uh, it opens it up to a study of the prophets. You'll see why the prophets come onto the scene, the warnings and so forth. And so it's almost, and I think this will carry us pretty much through, <laughs> through most of next year. So basically, it's a survey of the history of Israel. It's a survey of of the Old Testament. This is going to be a good study. It'll be All the good... pages are stuck together in my Bible. That's right. <laughs> Either that's good or it's bad because you never read it. <laughs> I, I need to be there. That's what it means. I need to be there. That's right. All right. Understanding the kings will help us understand the story of Israel. It'll help us to understand the story of God's covenant, God's faithfulness to his people, plus the warnings, the warnings that God gave through the prophets. Uh, do you know the first king, who the first king of Israel is? Saul. Saul. Saul was the first king. Saul was the first king. Now, we're not going to look into the life of Saul. We're just going to do, uh, I'll just give you a little brief overview of Saul. We're going to jump in to David. Uh, but Saul, if you remember when Saul came about, it's because the, the people of Israel demanded a king like the other nations. And they, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. So, so Saul was chosen. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he, he started off well. I mean, he looked the part. He was a, he was a tall, good-looking guy. But uh, then David comes onto the scene. David kills Goliath. Um, David starts to get all the claim, and then Saul becomes jealous. And for 10 years, Saul is chasing down David, trying to kill David. So David's on the run. In the meantime, uh, Samuel anoints David as future king during Saul's reign. But David had to wait, of course, until God saw fit to end the reign of Saul. What's notable about David is that even while he was running from King Saul... He still honored him as king. He still honored him. He, uh, he had opportunities to kill him. He had opportunities to take his life. But he honored. That, he, he said, touch not mine anointed. So he honored the king. Um, David was best friends with Saul's son. Do you know who Saul's son was that he was best friends with? It was Jonathan. That's right. And so the years of running, actually, 10 years of running is actually what prepared David to be king. He grew in his faith. He grew in character. He earned the respect of people. He grew as a leader. He actually formed his own army. He had soldiers fighting with him that would do anything for him. He wrote many of the Psalms uh, during the time that he was running. And, of course, that's uh, seeing how David grew through adversity. It's a lesson that we grow the most through adversity. We grow the most uh, through challenging times. Those 10 years, of course, on the surface, it didn't look good for David when he was running for his life, but that was his training to be king. 
And although we don't like the challenging times, we don't like the adversity, those are the times that we really grow. Those are the times that we grow in our character and grow in our, um, in our endurance. It's in the tough times. And I'm sure you've all had seasons of your life that it was the season of hell. <laughs> but looking back, you probably see that, that, wow, that was what God really developed me and God really uh, prepared me and, and strengthened my faith. And so 1 Samuel 31, uh, you don't, we're going to pick up in 2 Samuel 2, but in 1 Samuel 31 is the day that Saul and his sons are killed in battle. You can read that for yourself to see how they died. Uh, so in 2 Samuel 1, David learns of Saul's death. And you would think that he would be rejoicing. <laughs> My arch nemesis is dead. But David's not rejoicing. When he hears the news that King Saul has been killed in battle, he actually falls on his own swords after he's been wounded. Uh, he, he mourns. He mourns. He's sorrowful. He rips his clothes. He mourns. Um, and then he recognizes, well, now is the time that it is, this is the appointed time for, for me to be king, to step into the role as king. And this is where we're going to pick up in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 2. Uh, we're not going to do a study on the life of David. A study on the life of David is, I mean, it's, it's exhaustive. But uh, we're basically just going to look, we're going to pick a king each week, all right? Uh, so we're just going to look at him becoming king today. So in 2 Samuel uh, 2 verse 1, it says, It happened after this, after he found out, after he went through the, the time of mourning, he, uh, he says that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he said to Hebron. Hebron, Hebron, however you want to pronounce it. While Saul was ruling and David was on the run, it's important to note that he and his men went to Ziklag. Ziklag was a Philistine territory. And we know that we know there's a history between David and the Philistines, right? <laughs> there's always a, a... But he makes a peace treaty with the king of the Philistine to dwell in Ziklag. Now, there's a lot of underlying stories there. It actually goes to battle with him. But he finds out that Saul is killed while him and his men are in Ziklag. So obviously, if he's becoming king, he can't rule Israel while living in Philistine territory of Ziklag. So what did David do? He does what he's famous for doing. He calls out to God. God, what is your will? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to go back to Judah? Of course, David's from Judah. God says, yes. Where do you want me to go? Go to Hebron. And uh, Hebron is where David goes back to. Hebron is an important city in the southern part of Judah. Hebron is about 25 miles from Ziklag, so it's still close to Philistine territory. And last year, I think it was last year when we did our Genesis study, Hebron is, in a, very, is a very important city in the history of Israel. Do you remember anything about Hebron? Do you remember Abraham? <laughs> Abraham lived in Hebron, Hebron, however you want to say, I don't know. How. Hebron, uh, it was also the burial place of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah. And so that's where David moves back to. It says, verse 2, So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And, of course, we know that they had multiple wives in those days. It still wasn't good, but they had multiple wives. Here's a note. Uh, David had another wife, another wife named Michal. Michael. If you heard of Michael, do you know who Michael McCow was? Saul's daughter. Saul's daughter. Yeah. Saul's daughter after he defeated Goliath. But what happens is Michael, while uh, David was on the run from Saul, Michael helped David escape. So what did Saul do? He, no, he, he takes the daughter from David <laughs> 
He said, you ain't, you ain't going to be married to my daughter. And he gives her to another man. <laughs> so that's behind. And we're going to see something here in just a minute. And so he snatches David's wife away and gives, gives her to another man named Paltis. P-A-L-T-I-S to be his wife. So look at verse 3. And that's going to come into play in, in just a bit. Verse 3. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household, so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now Samuel had already anointed David as king by God. He's God's anointed, so now the people are recognizing him as the king of Judah. It says, and, and they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. Now keep in mind the men of Jabesh Gilead, they were loyalists to Saul. Okay? So, and he's blessing them. I, he says, the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant. For your master Saul is dead and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Basically, what David is doing is David's trying to unite the kingdom. You have Judah, the house of Judah, that's, that, that's those who anointed David as king. And then you have the house of Saul, the rest of the tribes of, uh, of Israel. So he's trying to bring them together. The kingdom, the kingdom is divided. Saul's been killed. He still has loyalists, the men of Jabesh Gilead. So there's still others that are still uh, loyal. So, so the people of Judah had united around David, but they're still in other, those in other tribes that are having a hard time accepting David as king, and we'll see that. They're just not going to unite as easy uh, under David. And, of course, that's the men of Jabesh Gilead. So David is sending word, letting them know, hey, I appreciate how you treated Saul. You did a good thing. God's going to bless you. And, and also, I bless you too. I'm, I'm going to bless you too. Uh, but, but he also lets them know that Saul's dead. I'm the king. Let's join together, let's unite, let's become one kingdom. The people of Judah unite, but, in verse 8, but Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. In other words, we're not uniting. The commander in Saul's armies is not uniting. So he takes Saul's son and sets him up as king. He made him, verse 9, king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, those are tribes, and over all Israel. Verse 10, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. The house of Judah was, they were faithful to David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Abner knew that David was God's anointed, but he just wasn't going to come under the rule of David. He was loyal to Saul. After all, as the commander of Saul's army, Ab, army Abner was commanded by Saul to kill David. Abner was the one chasing him around. So he appointed Ishbosheth, the only living son of Saul, to be king. And a lot of people don't realize that when David started off his kingship, it, he didn't just take the throne and life was good. And he was, no, there was, there was division. There was a civil war. That's what's, that's what's about to happen. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, is, is put as king of the rest of Israel. Bible doesn't say much about Ishbosheth, but it's clear that he was a puppet. <laughs> it's clear he was he was a weak leader. <laughs> he he only reigns for two years. We're gonna go through and we'll see the fall. 
Uh, he was a pawn used to maintain control of the kingdom. In other words, and I wrote this down today, the deep state was not about to give up control of the swamp. Right. <laughs> With that, once you tasted power, we're not giving it up. <laughs> we're not, even if God has anointed another person, we're not going to give up control. Saul and Abner both knew that God had taken the, you know, kings, it was father to son, to son, to son, to son. But God blocked that. He stopped the dynasty of Saul. They knew that. But Saul still must have arranged for Ishbosheth to be king because when, when Saul and his three sons went out to battle, they all died. They left Ishbosheth behind. So there must have been some kind of secession. Hey, in case we get killed, we, we're going to make sure that, that my son gets on the throne. But anyways... Uh, even though Ishbosheth was made king of the rest of Israel, he still was not God's anointed. And after two years, his kingdom would fall. The house of cards would crumble down. And, and it is amazing. I was reading a, a commentary today. And uh, when I was studying for this, and the commentary was 20 years ago. And what was striking was uh, Warren Wearsby, he says, you can see similar scenarios in today's politics. And this was written 20 years ago. <laughs> you, you see, and, and even, even more so today, you have the weak leaders, you have the puppets, you have the pawns like Ishbosheth. <laughs> they get, they rise to their level because of connections. They, they rise to the level because they're, they can be puppets. They're bought off the lobbyist. <laughs> They, they're, they're willing to do anything, sell their souls, sell the country out for some money. You have the Ishbosheths. Then you have the selfish people like Abner. They're, they're, the, the, puppet, they're the, the puppet masters. They're behind the scenes. They have their own personal agenda. They're the ones pulling the strings in the background. These are the people like the lifelong bureaucrats that are stuck, that are stuck in the swamp. Uh, these are also... Uh, the money bags, the big billionaires, the big globalist uh, world order billionaires. Uh, they're the ones that are pushing for the big global reset. Uh, the, I think of Bill Gates. I think of George Soros. I think of these types that are pushing all this stuff with their big money. But then you have the few that are out there like David. They're not afraid to take on the Goliaths. They know they're anointed. They know they're called. Uh, they're the ones that, uh, they're the real leaders. They're the ones that have the people's interest at heart. They have the nation's interest at heart. They're not going to sell out the nation to the world just so they can stay in power. And uh, we need more Davids nowadays, don't we? We need some Davids nowadays. We need, we need to get rid of the Ishbosheths and the Abners. And we need people who will put the interest of the people, politicians who will put the interest of the people. But there's a lesson here, not just politically, but spiritually, because as you see, as you see how Abner and Ishbosheth come into power, even though it is not God's will, it's also a lesson for us, because so often we're guilty of allowing our own personal agenda and our will to overrule God's will. It's God's will for this, but because of our agenda, we try to thwart God's will. And of course, that was, that's what was being done here. And even so often, we see how division is caused among God's people. Division caused even in churches. Instead of collectively uniting under God's will, you have this group that's got this agenda, this group that's got this agenda, and there's strife. And now, it's, fortunately, that's not here at our church. But it happens because, of, because we're people. We have, we have strong wills. The whole point is we need to yield. We need to submit to God's will because the devil, the devil loves strife. He loves getting a wedge in there. And that's what's taking place right now uh, with uh, Ishbosheth and Abner and David. So the result of all that is a civil war. Civil war breaks out. Verse 12. Now Abner, the son of Ner... And the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of 
Zariah and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. And for those joining online, I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and uh, verse 13. Verse 13. Joab, the son of Zariah and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So here's the two generals of the two armies. Abner, the general of now Ishbosheth's army. Joab is the general of David's army. And they're, they're at war. Then Abner said to Joab, let the young men, now this is kind of weird, let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So they arose and went over by number 12 from Benjamin, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 from the servants of David. So 12 soldiers got up. Each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called the Field of Sharp Swords, which is in Gibeon. Now that, that's, 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 that's like the duel. It's like literally they go, they meet, they grab each other, and they stab each other, and they drop down dead. And gone. <laughs> Verse 17. So there was a fierce battle that day, and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Uh, skip down to verse 3 if you want to read the rest of that yourself. Basically, Joab chases after, chases after Abner. Abner's like, man, why, do you, why are we doing this? We're brothers. We're brothers you know, in by blood. We're blood. Uh, so uh, chapter 3, verse 1. You can read that war for yourself. There's just more details about the war. Uh, it says in 3, verse 1, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So as time goes, as the battle's raging on, David's gaining more, more power. Any observations so far in the story? Some weird stuff, isn't it? <laughs> they were brutal. These, these people were brutal. Twelve tribes were split between Israel and Judah. Yeah. So when they're talking about the house of Saul, they're talking about the basically tribes. the tribes of Benjamin, the from uh, chapter Israel. Yeah, Israel, Ephraim, Gilead, all of those. What was the original reason why they split between the two? Do you, do you recall? Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly the reason. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't know the reason. So anyways, well, they're, they're all about to come together. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a division between uh, the house of Saul and David coming in. There was just a division there, I believe. It probably had a lot to do with Saul was so powerful and his army was so powerful when it was Judah and Saul's army. The others had to, they had to choose a side and they run to the side they think would win the battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, they go to the strength. That's a natural tendency. Mm -hmm. And God prevails through all of it, right? Mm -hmm. and so I think that's right. Yeah, you have the northern. Uh, Saul, they were north, and then Judah was down south. Now, notice Jerusalem's not even in the picture. And we're, we'll close the study. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. So the north and north and the south, basically. Okay, so here's where the story starts to twist. Because one day, I'm just, I'm just going to paraphrase through, I think it's chapter 3 or 4. Ishbosheth accuses Abner of sleeping with his wife. Now that changes everything, okay? Abner, yeah, it is, 3 verse 10. Abner is like, how dare you accuse me of this? Remember, Abner is the commander of Ishbosheth. I mean, he's like basically second in command. Ishbosheth accuses him of that. Abner, so here's what Adam, Adam, Abner says, and this is actually New Living Translation in verse 10. I'm going to take Saul's kingdom and give it to David. You accuse me of this? I'm going to take your kingdom that you're over and it's going to, be, it's going to belong to David. I will establish the throne of David over Israel as well as Judah. 
So that accusation caused Abner to completely turn on Ishbosheth, and now he's going to do all that he can to make sure that David takes over the whole entire kingdom. So Abner goes to David. David wants to join, or, or uh, Abner wants to join forces with David, but David says. You can join forces with me on one condition. You've got to get my wife back <laughs> from the Philist. You got to get my wife back from Palti, Paltis. And so Abner agrees. Now look at verse sixteen. So Abner he goes to the house of Paltis, and this is chapter three, verse sixteen of Second Samuel. He gets Michael. He grabs her, he, I mean, you know, her husband now. And it says, then her husband went along with her to Bahurim, weeping behind her. So, so, so Abner grabs Michael to take him back to the original husband. And his, her husband, Paltus, is following, this is funny to me, he's following behind crying while, while he's taking his wife away. Abner said to him, go return. And he returns. I don't know. I just thought that was that was comical because you come stealing my wife and you tell me to go home. I ain't going home. <laughs> so it, it, he must not really care too much about her. So uh, anyways, I was like, go return. Okay. <laughs> so he goes home. She was given to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, so anyways. It is. Yeah. It's, you can't think that you can't think it up really. <laughs> so Abner, in the meantime, Abner negotiates with Saul's, the rest of Saul's people, or Ishbosheth's people, the elders of his kingdom. He, he basically tells them, look, David is God's anointed. It's time that we join up with David's army. And so um, Abner convinces the elders of the kingdom of Ishbosheth to unite and become one kingdom. And so he goes, he tells David the news. Look, we things are good. We're going to come together now. David throws a big feast. Abner leaves to spread the words. As Abner leaves, Joab, David's commander, follows after Abner because Joab thinks, oh, Abner's here to spy. He's not legit. So what does Joab do? He grabs him and he stabs him in the stomach and he kills Abner. Before, <laughs> he's going back. He really, he was doing a good thing. So he kills Abner. And then in chapter four, like I said, this is just overview. In chapter four, King Ishbosheth is sleeping. So Abner's dead. King Ishbosheth is sleeping. Two of Ishbosheth's men. <coughs> Sneak in and kill Ishbosheth and cut off his head and take his head to King David. You can read this for yourself in, in chapter four. Takes it to King David's head and like, here you go. Aren't you happy? They, they, they thought that he was, they were going to get a reward. David's not happy. This is not what you do. This is, you are dishonoring a, an innocent man. So what does David do? David orders that the two men who cut off Ishbosheth's head, that their heads be cut off. <laughs> and so they hang their heads at the pool of Hebron. <laughs> so needless to say, it is, it's, it's crazy. But the kingdom is starting to unite under, under David. They're seeing that David is God's anointed. And go to chapter 5, and we'll read a little bit of chapter 5 as we wrap it up. So that's all the behind-the-scenes stuff. So chapter 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. All the tribes, there you go. They're all coming together now. You know, they see, he, this is God's man, and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. This is how it should be. I mean, all the tribes, they're all brothers. You know, it's like the, like the Civil War, right? Brothers fighting against brothers. Verse 2, also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. So now they're recognizing 
God's word. Verse 3, Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And so he was anointed king over Israel, but now do you see they're now, or king over Judah, now they are anointing him king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So David's kingdom is established. He's king of Israel. All of Israel is united as one kingdom, but yet there's still one thing left that he needs to do. He needs to take Jerusalem. He needs to take Jerusalem. And so at that time, Jerusalem was controlled by the Jebusites. So if you read in between the verses there, six through eight, you'll see that David went in and he took Jerusalem from the, the Jebusites. And that's where he would establish his throne in Jerusalem. Look at verse nine. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the millow and in inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And uh, his throne is established in Jerusalem, the city of Zion, the city of, of David. And so what a remarkable life David lived. As a, as a young shepherd boy, remember he killed the bear, he killed the lion. That's what prepared him to take on Goliath, which earned him a promotion. <laughs> but then uh, he would be on the run from Saul for 10 years. But it was through those years that he learned to wait on the Lord. He learned to trust. He learned uh, to build his faith and character. And so now the time had come for him to become king. He inherited a, a divided people. But with God's help, he united them. He set himself up. You know, he, he, you could tell he had the people's best interest at heart. He had the heart. He's called the man after God's own heart. He had the heart of God, even how he dealt with Saul, even how he dealt with Ishbosheth. I mean, you know, he, was, he, respected, he respected the, the, uh, the kings. Um, but now he's, Israel is a powerful Kingdom. David builds, I mean, David builds Israel to be a powerful kingdom. He sets up Jerusalem as the eternal capital. Now, of course, if you read through 2 Samuel, and we're not going to do that, uh, there's a lot of highs for David, but there's also a lot of lows. He, he does some crazy things, even as king. Uh, he commits adultery. He murders Bathsheba's husband. But even through all of that, he still called the man after God's own heart. God would establish his throne forever. And God would actually send his son to rule who came from the lineage of David. Uh, Peter said in Acts 2 verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, the fruit of his body, Jesus, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. In Revelation, we saw in Revelation, the throne of David, that Jesus would come to sit on the throne of David. Uh, David's reign on earth represents Christ's eternal reign throughout eternity. And I'm going to read this as, as we close. Uh, the commentator Warren Wearsby he wrote that in his, in his accession to the throne of Israel, David illustrates Jesus Christ, the son of David. Like David the shepherd, Jesus came first as a humble servant and was anointed king privately. Like David the exile, Jesus is king today, but doesn't yet reign on the throne of David. That's a future that's coming, the millennial kingdom. Like Saul in David's day, Satan is still free to obstruct God's work and oppose God's people. One day, Jesus will return in glory, Satan will be imprisoned, and Jesus will reign in his glorious kingdom. God's people today faithfully pray, thy kingdom come and eagerly await the return of their king. And that's the rise of King David. 
What do you? What are some lessons that you see through this story? What are some applications that you can see? Well, there was a lot of things that the Lord had to. I mean, from to ensure that David became the king of Israel, mm -hmm. all the all the junk that was happening with the civil war and and all the back, you know, and, and the things that the Lord had to to overcome that to see mm -hmm. that David would surely be anointed yeah. by the people. Yeah. Eventually. I mean, just being in, looking through it from human eyes, from David's standpoint or one of his leaders' standpoint and what's going on during the Civil War and before the war and all those other things, you know, it had to look pretty daunting. You know, here's one of the nations against all of the others. The strong army is all against them and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. How, you know, so just to stand through all that. And knowing that you've got, knowing that you've already got the prophetic word, the prophetic anointing, right. what, how is yeah. this? So I, I mean, actually, like if the world was coming against the U.S., mm. what would we do? Mm. Would we stand firm or would we strike a deal? Don't kill us and we'll do that. Mm. We would strike the deal, mm -hmm. right? I mean, honestly, we would strike the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yep. and that's basically what was happening here is, the, you know, all of Israel was coming against David and, and his little... His little army that he'd been hiding with mm. for 10 years. Yep, that's right. Um, it, it had to just look, you know, insurmountable. Mm. To that's the story of David's life, isn't it? fast in that. Is, <laughs> is, that's faith. Yep. <laughs> if, it, if it was easy then it could say that David did this. <laughs> right. But right. even though as great of exactly. a warrior as David was, it had right. to be God. And actually, I wrote that down, that it gives us assurance in the covenant and the promises of God. Mm -hmm. That God is faithful to his promise. God will complete what he started. And during the battle part of this, it even said that David was winning. His army was winning. Yeah. They were growing stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So they were actually winning the physical battle mm -hmm. that, was, that was coming at them. Yep, that's right. What are some other personal lessons? I see patience, trusting in God's will. Learning to wait in God's time. David was anointed, but it was in God's time. It was in God's time. Resisting, resisting the, the urge to push my agenda when it's not God's will. Mm -hmm. Allowing my agenda to overrule God's will. That's a big, that's a big lesson here. That's the lesson with with Ishbosheth and Abner. There's definitely, definitely a lot there. And uh, 2 Samuel, if you want to read this week through 2 Samuel, next week we'll go into the next king. But that's a, it's a fun read. If you like exciting, exciting stories, read through 2 Samuel. David's, he's a hero. He is, he is definitely a hero. All right. Well, let's, uh, I'll close in prayer and we'll sign off. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your faithful, your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Father, for just when we read these stories, we see that, that your hand is, was all in them. The, this, the story of these kings, the story of David, it, it's just a confirmation of, of your faithfulness to your people, your covenant to Israel, your promises, Father. And even when things don't look like they're going to work out, if you said it, if you, if you said it, they're going to come to pass, Father. And so, Father, I just pray that you would teach us patience. Help us to wait upon you, Father. Help us to trust in your word, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to, help us to resist pushing our own agenda. Help us to, to, to desire to follow your will and your guidance, Lord, in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Signing off, everybody. Thanks for watching online.